Now, what about the Paris Accords? Or the possibility of international diplomacy, uh, being able to get the Chinese and the Indians and uh, the Europeans and the North Americans all on the same page on this. I mean, particularly in light of what you just observed about the fact that uh, most of humanity has yet to fully uh, empower itself to enjoy the benefits of of the modern technological civilization that we take for granted, which depends on fossil fuels. Ain't going to happen. All right. We're not going to reduce. <laughs> We're not going to go to zero, certainly by 2050. Even John Kerry admits that now. Uh, and we're not going to go to zero globally, certainly before the end of the century. Hi, this is Glenn Lowry. Uh, you've tuned into The Glenn Show. Uh, I'm at Substack.com. The Glenn Show is sponsored by the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, where I am the John Paulson Senior Fellow. And I'm talking with Stephen Coonan, who's a theoretical physicist. Are you still at NYU, Stephen? I, I am. I'm still a professor at NYU, and I teach regularly. Stephen is a former undersecretary of the Department of Energy under President Obama and author of the book Unsettled, what climate science tells us, what it doesn't, and why it matters. Uh, so that's what we're talking about here today. Uh, welcome, Stephen. Good, good to be chatting with you, Glenn. So how's the book been doing? It's been out for a while, no? Yeah, it's it was published in at the end of April in 2021, so it's been out for about 18 months or so, a little more. And uh, the response has been remarkable, uh, far exceeding the expectations that the publisher had or, or I had. Uh, we've sold just about 200,000 copies. We've got translations into... Congratulations. Uh, thank you. About 10 languages. Um, I, I think it it really shows that people are, uh, some class of people, are hungry for a straightforward, factual-based discussion of climate and energy issues. I take it, therefore, that, in your view, we haven't been getting that. No, we, you know, we haven't. Uh, I'd like to distinguish between the underlying science which is about as good as any other science and about as well done versus the science that the politicians and the media talk about. And they're really quite different. Okay, so I think I know the narrative that the, the Earth is warming, uh, that it is due to human activity, uh, that the forecasts are uh, apocalyptic in the event that we don't make radical interventions to mitigate um, that uh, fossil fuels are not the future, uh, so on. What, what's, what's wrong with that picture? Well, you know, it starts, let, let me tell you some things about that picture that are true. Uh, it is true that the globe has been warming since 1900 or so for the last 120 years, and we've seen about a 1.3 degree centigrade rise in that time. Over uh, what period since? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, since 1900, roughly. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, we also know that humans are having an influence on the climate by increasing the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and that increase is largely due to fossil fuels. I think where the narrative starts to become fuzzy, if not incorrect, is how much will the globe warm as a result of those human influences, as opposed to many other causes that cause the climate to change? And second, will that warming be catastrophic or not? And that latter point, uh, I think, is the heart of the alarmism that is being promoted. And it's just not in accord with the science or in accord with common sense. And then finally, there's the issue of what could we, should we, will we do about this circumstance? And that's a whole other dimension which uh, we can get into because in part, it involves not just the hard science, but values and uh, technology as well. Well, let's talk about the science to start off then. Uh, you say that uh, the apocalyptic forecast is unwarranted. Uh, you say there's some uncertainty about the extent to which human activity is, is responsible for what we're observing. Can you elaborate? Yeah. So we should first understand that human influences on the climate 
are physically very small, at the level of half a percent or so. In other words, humans are increasing the heat trapping of ability of the atmosphere because of greenhouse gases uh, by about half a percent, maybe a little bit less. And that half a percent then is supposed to cause all kinds of catastrophic changes. But if you look at how the world has prospered since 1900, so if you compare 1900 to today, which is a warming of 1.3 degrees, as I mentioned, human lifespan has gone from 32 years to 72 years on average. The global economy per capita has gone up by about a factor of seven. Mortality from extreme weather has plummeted by about a factor of 50. Literacy has gone up by a factor of four or something. You know, you can go through all sorts of measures of human well-being. To think that another 1.3 degrees of warming over the next 100 years, which is about what the UN projects will happen, to think that that would derail or even significantly retard that progress just beggars belief. And in fact, if you read the IPCC reports, that's what they say. It's just that when it gets out then to the general public, to the politicians, the media, and so on, you'll hear the words climate catastrophe, uh, emergency, code red for humanity, and so on. And that's just nonsense. There may oh, be an on. issue here. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. No, I just want to ask a question. Yeah. So, okay, there's been tremendous human progress since 1900. There's also been a 1.3 degree centigrade increase in average temperature. If I understand you, you're saying that that was a price worth paying and that that's an assessment of the retrospective. That is, we went up 1.3, we got a doubling of life expectancy. I'll take that any day. What does that have to do with the forecast of what we can anticipate if things keep going in this direction? Well, uh, you know, the best predictor of future performance is past performance. <laughs> I've heard that yeah, somewhere. Right, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Look, humans are wonderfully adaptable. We have people living from Hudson Bay up in Canada all the way down to the equator in a great range of climates and the ability to adapt and to prosper. Another 1.3 degrees on average. We've already seen more than 1.3 degrees in the mid-latitudes in the northern uh, hemisphere, and we're doing just fine. There are many other issues, uh, some of which you know well, uh, that we need to be dealing with, but climate is among the least of the threats that we uh, are facing. How come then the uh, almost uniform and um, uh, unvaried uh, reportage, you know, the characterization that I'm getting of what you know, how come the president of the United States is running for office in part and the party that you serve uh, uh, admirably is uh, betting all its chips on climate? So, I, you know, I like to quote H.L. Mencken, who, uh, as you know, but just to remind people, was a journalist writing in the early 20th century, very astute. And he wrote at one point, the purpose of practical politics is to keep the electorate alarmed by a series of mostly imaginary hobgoblins so that they can be clamoring to be led to safety. And so, <laughs> right? I, and you see it in politics all the time, not just in climate, in immigration, in um, vaccinations, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, I, you know, some of that is certainly valid. But the political system and the media naturally tend to alarmism because that's what gets human attention. The danger here is that tinkering with the energy system, which is the way we need to uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, more than tinkering, actually a radical transformation, will strike at a crucial system for society, one that is the lifeblood of society. And if you change that too rapidly uh, or change it too much too soon, um, you can do great damage, much greater damage than anything that climate might induce. Okay. Um, I noticed in your uh, book a concern about the accuracy of the models that are, I think, the bedrock of the scientific prediction 
about the effects of uh, climate change. Um, what, what, what's yeah. what's wrong with these models? And you know, uh, if if not them, then what what would we rely upon in order to chart the course going forward? There's nothing wrong with the models. But I think the people who build the models are doing the best job that they can. Um, it's just that this is an extraordinarily difficult problem. Uh, let me just briefly talk about how Please the models do. are built and yeah. um, then talk about some of the, the problems. You, what, the way you build a, a large computer model of the Earth's climate is to cut the ocean and atmosphere into cubes. The cubes uh, start by covering about 100 kilometers, 60 miles on a side, and you build them up into the atmosphere and then down into the ocean. And you do that over the whole globe, and you get a couple million cubes. And then what you have to do is use the laws of physics, the conservation of energy, matter, and so on, to track the motion of the air, the water, the energy, um, the particulates, the winds, as it, they move through these squares, one next to the other, and so on. And you need to do that at time intervals of 10 minutes, and you need to do it for many centuries. And so you can see very quickly that this becomes a grand computational challenge. Now, what are the problems? You might say, well, we understand the laws of physics really well. Newton understood those. Uh, what could be wrong? And one of the principal problems is that the, you can't make the cubes too small. If you make the cubes too small, the computational effort goes up very rapidly. And so people have settled in the modern era uh, cubes of about 60 miles on a side, as I said. And unfortunately, there are a lot of climate phenomena, think about clouds and thunderheads, that have sizes much smaller than 60 miles. And so you can't follow those in the computer. You've got to make up what's going on on those smaller scales. For example, given the temperature, humidity uh, in uh, one of these cubes, where are the clouds? How many clouds are there? Are they high? Are they low? And so on. Different people make different assumptions, and so you get different answers. And unfortunately, we're looking for small, physically small effects that are very hard to untangle, depending on what assumptions you make. So there are, the world uses about 50 different models, and they give 50 different answers. Uh, and the numbers you hear in the media are kind of the average of all those models, or maybe even usually the worst case uh, from all of those models. So it's a tough job. The, you know, one of the ways in which we can test the models is to look in the past and ask, did they describe what happened in the past? And unfortunately, yeah. we don't have very good data going back in the past. The record of temperatures and weather records are maybe 150 years long, but a lot of climate actually happens in the ocean. So what are the temperatures, the current salinities in the ocean going back 100 years? We don't have really good data at all. So that also plagues the uh, modeling business. Now, we have models in economics, but nothing, nothing like this. I'm, but I am trying to get my head around exactly what's going on cubes so this is an this is like an analog you you kind of create a artificial uh hyp hypothetical uh environment at the cube level and you use physics to figure out what's going to happen there and then you aggregate up across all the cubes to the entire planet yeah and you're saying there's not enough detail in in the cubes because if you were to make them fine enough to capture the relevant detail, you'd, you'd have your computer running forever before it could calculate. You, you got it. Very good. Yeah. And, you know, the, it, at the, deep, the level of computational effort goes up as the third power of the size of the cubes. So if you went from a 60-mile wide cube to a 30-mile wide cube, you get eight times as much computing you have to do. And so people think the weather models, which are different than climate models, Weather models run with very fine spacing, the level of one or two kilometers a mile or so. Uh, if you were to try to bring the climate models to that level of detail, 
you're probably looking at most of a century before we have the computing ability to be able to do useful climate runs at that resolution. Are the uh, sea levels rising? Uh, oh. Is Miami going to be flooded? Is that... <laughs> right. Well, so there are a set of climate impacts that people worry about. Sea level is one. Hurricanes is another we can, we can talk about in, in a, a mm -hmm. minute or two. Um, and so let me talk about sea level. Uh, sea level depends fundamentally on the amount of water in the ocean. And when the Earth was last covered with great glaciers, which was about 20,000 years ago, the sea level was about 400 feet lower than it is today. The coastline around Manhattan was 50 miles out from the present one. And as those glaciers melted over the course of about 10, 12,000 years, the sea levels rose by 400 feet. Um, since about 8,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago, that rising has slowed down, but it's still rising. So what we're concerned about is not whether sea level is rising. It's been doing that for 20,000 years. What we are concerned about is whether it's rising more rapidly now as the result of human influences or not. And there are good reasons to expect that it is and will be rising more rapidly, but that's contradicted by more than a bit of the data. Let me give you an example. I'm just about to put a piece in the Wall Street Journal about the sea level in Manhattan, at the tip of Manhattan in the battery. We have a tide gauge in the battery that's been there since about 1856. And it measures, which is the southern tip of Manhattan, and it measures how high the sea is. Of course, the sea goes up and down every day with the tides, the waves, even more frequently than that, um, with the seasons. But we're talking about averages now, which can be calculated or measured. Um, and over that time, over the last 160 some odd years, it's been going up at about three millimeters a year, which is um, about a foot a century. And of course, New York City has managed to adapt very well to that. Yes, we get the occasional storm flood, but by and large, on a longer time scale, the city's done just fine. If you look over the last hundred years and ask, how rapidly has it been rising on shorter time scales? Would you discover it go, the rate of rise goes up and down? Some years it was rising as much as six millimeters a year, and other years it was down over one millimeter a year. And, and the, that, those changes happen on a 60 year time scale. They're due to changes in the North Atlantic and the Gulf Stream and so on. The, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and NASA put out reports um, earlier this year, or earlier last year in February and, and uh, November, that said that over the next 30 years, the sea level in Manhattan is going to rise at three times that average rate. And so we would see a foot by 2050 rise from where it is currently. And if you put that up on a graph, you say, whoa, that's completely discordant with experience. Um, so we shall see uh, whether that happens or not. I think it's another case of uh, you know, discussion of the worst case as opposed to what's more likely to happen based on historical experience. So if it's going to rise that rapidly over the next 30 years, we're going to know it pretty quickly. Uh, now, why isn't this simple-minded thought the ice is melting because it's getting warmer. When the ice melts, the ocean rises. It's inexorable. Look at what's happening to the Greenland, you know, ice mass or whatever. Uh, it's melting. And that's demonstrable. I've seen the photographs, et cetera. So why, why, why isn't it, okay. it, it unavoidable that the sea yeah. level will rise? So, so it, it is. The question is, how, as I said, how rapidly how are humans contributing to that? So let me talk about Greenland, which is another famous Greenland ice impact. Right, of climate impact. So if you go back a few years, you can see a NASA press release and you can see an article in The Guardian that says in 2020, for example, or 2019, 
Greenland is melting three times more rapidly than it did in 1990. Um, and, you know, that turns out to be true. But if you look at the data, the official data from the Danish Meteorological Organization, which tracks this, it was melting just as rapidly in 1930, when human influences were much smaller than they are today. And the rate of melting, while it was high in 1930, then went down a lot, got very small in 1990, and then has climbed from 1990 to 2018 or so. And if you look at the last few years, it's actually going down again. So the hmm. fact that the rate of melting has been going up and down, even as the globe has been warming, suggests that there are many other factors at play, maybe even dominant. And it turns out, in fact, that the variation of currents and winds and temperatures in the North Atlantic has a major influence on how fast Greenland loses ice. The IPCC says that. You're now seeing articles from mainstream climate scientists saying, well, the melting is going to slow down, uh, but don't worry, it's going to come back again at some point. Maybe they're right. But to take just 30 years in a record and say, aha, we're in great trouble, is completely disingenuous. About a year ago, last February, I published an article in the Wall Street Journal, which seems to be the only paper that will publish me these days, for reasons you probably well understand. I just showed the data, the official data, over 100 years. And, you know, anybody with a little bit of logic can look at it and see, ah, it goes up and down a lot, and maybe we shouldn't get so alarmed about the last 30 years. Um, and you know, most people wrote back and said, thanks for providing that context. Um, a couple of the experts uh, wrote back and said, you know, Kunin's right about the data, but we disagree with his interpretation. So we'll, we'll see. Anyway, uh, you know, don't, so climate is highly variable on its own, and we should not get fooled by what happens over 10 or 20 or 30 years. Now, this strikes me, I'm obviously not an expert, but it strikes me as a really important point that it's the many forces are at work, among which are human activity. The relative significance of human activity in comparison to these other forces might not be that great. If so, all of the remedial actions that we're taking to try to head off, you know, stymie and uh, uh, avoid uh, may not have that much of an impact at the end of the day. And is it crazy to think, and you know, I don't, again, know the science at all, that uh, there are other forces at work, like geothermal forces or solar uh, activity. There's weather on the surface of the sun as well as weather on the surface of the earth. Um, uh, could these factors, which are hard to predict or maybe even impossible to predict, uh, nevertheless, end up having the major say about what happens with climate on, on the planet. Yeah. I, so, of course, the UN has looked, or maybe not the UN, but the researchers have looked at some of those other factors. In terms of the sun, in terms of the intensity of sunlight, uh, we don't see any change that is large enough to be significant for the climate. The sun influences the Earth in other ways. For example, the particles, the solar wind, as it's called, uh, maybe an influence. People have looked for that, have not found it. Geothermal, on average, uh, over the whole globe is, again, too small. It's about an order of magnitude smaller than human influences uh, uh -huh. on the climate. But not to say localized geothermal influences might not have an effect. You know, Greenland and the Antarctic have got hot spots and volcanoes under them. And I think it's still an open question about whether they can be making the ice slip more easily uh, underneath. Um, so uh, to be uh, determined as a research subject. But I think long term, if you think over a century or two, and if humans continue emitting greenhouse gases, the changes will become, uh, the influence will become greater and probably the response will become more significant. So this is not something to be dismissed on a couple century time scale, but I think saying we've got to get to net zero by 2050 or the world is going to come to an end uh, just completely misrepresents the situation.
Well, I want to talk about where you think we ought to be trying to get, but I want to ask you about uh, uh, extreme weather events and uh, their relationship to the climate debate, because, you know, when I pick up my newspaper, that's what I'm hearing about, hearing about hurricanes and tornadoes and so on. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, so, you know, if you read the IPCC report or the research literature about hurricanes, let's talk about that first. You know, they say for most measures of the frequency or intensity of hurricanes, there is no trend on a century time scale. The reason that they hold back on that is that there is one study that came out just before the IPCC issued its report in August of 2021 about the science that says that the fraction of hurricanes that are stronger has gone up over the last 40 years. Um, But, you know, the paper itself says this is only 40 years, it's a new method. But more interestingly, there were subsequent papers that said maybe this is just a return to normal. So I think for hurricanes, at least on the shorter time scale, there is, uh, it's unsettled, if I might uh, use that. (laughs) Quite a Um, term. And, and, you know, you see great ups and downs in the hurricane measures uh, with periods of multi-decades in the North Atlantic where we have the best measures. So, uh, you know, um, even the experts uh, under um, duress, uh, if you get them questioned by a scientist as opposed to a reporter, uh, will admit that there's a lot we don't know and we have not seen really significant trends in the hurricane. Uh, uh, there, like there is uh, just one more on extreme yeah, of weather. Uh, you know, if you're again taking the cue from the IPCC, um, we have seen temperatures go up, and so hot days uh, have become more common. Heat waves in some parts of the world have become more frequent. Uh, but beyond the temperature related measures, we have seen more intense periods of precipitation over much of the land. We see that here in the Northeast quite strikingly, over the last 50 or 60 years. But again, there are these long-term cycles in the weather system that make it tough to attribute um, any particular changes to human influence. Okay. Now, you've been uh, an administrator in government and in academia and the uh, science area, and I'm just sitting here wondering if you're right, about the uh, uh, misreporting of and overstating and mischaracterization of what the science tells us. What does that say about the relationship between science and politics? And where's the where are the adults if science is being inappropriately deployed on behalf of political goals, protecting the sacred temple of wisdom, which is the scientific enterprise itself. Because the, the corrupting effects of uh, the politicization of science will have uh, negative consequences in other areas, uh, you know. Uh, you know, it, it's very disappointing to me as a scientist to see that. And one of the reasons I think I haven't been canceled, but much, but, but rather ignored, Uh, is because I try to base everything I say on the official science. So it's very hard for people to say, that guy Kunin got it wrong. Um, And when I point this out to scientists in private, including more than a few in the consensus, uh, they will agree with me. Uh, But when you get out into public discussion, the media, politics, uh, they won't. Um, they won't say that. You know, the, the, you lose a great deal of uh, professional prestige, uh, prominence, um, credibility among many people if you speak out against the consensus. Um, and, you know, if I were younger, if I were earlier in my career, uh, I might not be as outspoken. But um, this is an important issue for me not only for the credibility of science, but the fact that, again, we can be damaging the energy system through ill-motivated and ill-considered changes. Uh, and we've got to make sure we don't do that, even as we try to respond to 
the desire to reduce human influences on the planet. Do you support the efforts to promote uh, green energy development, uh, solar panels, uh, electric vehicles, uh, so on? Well, okay, so so let's get on to that first. Yeah, uh, you know, what do we do about the energy system? What do we do about uh, it? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, we have to realize that this is a global issue. Uh, the United States, 330 million people are 4.5% of the global population. The whole developed world, about 1.5 billion. That leaves 6.5 billion people in the developing world. And those folks do not have enough energy to give them a reasonable standard of living. And so anybody who wants to reduce greenhouse gases globally, has got to first answer the question, what are you going to do about those six and a half billion people? Because for them, the most reliable and convenient way to get that energy is with fossil fuels, coal and gas. The inequalities are out astounding. You know, the average U.S. person uses 30 times the energy that a person in Nigeria uses. And there are about three billion people who use less electricity every year than the average U.S. refrigerator uses. Right? So, you know, what are you going to do about them? It is immoral to uh, advocate reducing greenhouse gas emissions without saying how you're going to get those folks energy. Now, you might say, well, we in the U.S. should lead the way. All right, let's talk about that. The U.S., first of all, is 13% of greenhouse gas emissions, and that number is going down because the rest of the world is emitting more. Um, and the U.S. is reducing its own emissions. So, um, if the U.S. went to zero tomorrow, that reduction would be negated by about a decade's worth of growth. So, you know, we've got to be mindful of what the significance of our going to zero might be. The current administration wants to go to zero by deploying a lot of wind and solar. And, you know, that's fine, but there are lots of drawbacks to wind and solar. The most important is that they only generate electricity when the wind blows or when the sun shines. And when it doesn't blow or shine, you got no electricity. And that means you need a backup system that's going to ride through those periods when uh, you don't have wind or solar producing. Unfortunately, those periods can last up to a couple weeks. When in Germany, where um, they've got a lot of wind power now, uh, they've got a name for that phenomenon. It's called Dunkelflaute, which means a dark stillness. And they last for weeks at a time. We see the same thing in Texas. What that means is that your backup system has got to be at least as capable as the wind and solar. And therefore, the cost of electricity is going to be at least twice what it is if we're only wind and solar. So we need the backup, it's going to be expensive, uh, and it's not going to be emissions-free. So wind and solar fine, uh, takes a lot of land, uses a lot of critical materials, rare earths, um, copper. Um, so there are issues. I like to think that the current um, zeitgeist is a little bit like um, the Roadrunner cartoon where you see Wiley Coyote, who's been run off the cliff by the roadrunner, and he's <laughs> suspended in midair with a surprised yeah. look on his face. He suddenly realizes that there are some things that are not going to go well for him. And that's what the whole green energy thing is like right now. We're starting to realize the problems with this transition, and it's going to be nowhere near as easy or as rapidly as most people think. What about nuclear power to generate electricity? So full disclosure, I'm a nuclear physicist by training, uh, and so the atom is my friend. Um, um, if you want emissions-free, reliable electricity, I think nuclear energy, namely fission, the way we tap into the nucleus now, has got to be a big part of the future. It already provides. 19, 18% of U.S. electricity, 
We know how to do it. The problem is that the current generation of reactors are too big. They cost a lot of money, $20 billion. Uh, they take a long time to build. Um, and nobody wants to put down that kind of money uh, on a 50-year time scale. When I was in the government and people after me, have been encouraging the development of much smaller reactors, about the 10th size of the current big one. Those could be built in a factory, so they're all of the same design. They can be deployed successively on a site to ease the finances, and they'd be much easier to license. So we might see the first one of those in the ground in the U.S. or in the West before the end of the decade. China's going great guns on this. So, yeah, nuclear is important. I think the problem of the spent fuel is, is soluble in a technical sense, has been solved. Uh, it's just not soluble in a political sense at the moment. Well, tell me about that, because when I was coming along years and years ago and people were talking, at, I was at the Kennedy School, there were people talking about waste, the management of waste and the, the, the deep problem of secure uh, you know, deployment of the waste products from nuclear power generation. What, you think that problem's been solved? How so? Yeah, I, you know, I think we can have monitored retrievable storage. Uh, you know, uh, Yucca Mountain was uh, going to be that price until the politics derailed it. Uh, there are people talking about putting waste in boreholes, so under the ground, deep under the ground, so you could pull it out if you needed to. Uh, you know, on the time scale of a thousand years, um, it's just fine. Um, and again, you have to weigh those really small risks uh, against what you think is the climate risk. Um, and I would submit that um, uh, nuclear has certainly got a lot going for it right now. Compared to renewables, nuclear also has a much smaller footprint. Uh, renewables take 10, 20 times the land. And, you know, you're starting to see in rural America, uh, and also offshore in the Northeast, the wind developers starting to have to pull back because of either local opposition or the fact that the wind is the wind turbines are getting so expensive because of supply chain issues. So not the panacea that everybody thinks. You know, both climate and energy are complicated, nuanced subjects, and none of that comes through in the popular discussions. I teach at NYU in the fall, of course, on climate science, and in the spring, of course, on energy. And those students at the master's level come away with their eyes opened up about just how complicated and difficult these issues are. Okay. Uh, you, uh, in the uh, book with a couple of chapters, Who Broke the Science and How to Fix the Science? Uh, I guess we've already been talking a little bit about who broke the science, but I wouldn't mind hearing you elaborate on that. And I'm especially concerned about how you think uh, you can fix the science given the political, uh, you know, winds that are blowing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I, what I have seen is the the scientific institutions. I think the National Academies, which in many respects does a great job on other areas, have fallen down on this one. Uh, the Administration's Office on Science and Technology Policy, uh, the professional societies, uh, have all in some ways jumped on the bandwagon and have been suppressing the um, uncertainties in the science, uh, the fact that not much is happening with extreme weather, um, the difficulties in making a transition to a low emissions. Um, and you know, there are many people, and it's not just me or the small group of friends, I think there are many people who realize this just don't want to speak out. How to fix it? I think in some ways the science, the situation is going to fix itself, not without some pain. As the measures that are being proposed to reduce emissions, the banning of internal combustion engines, uh, after 2035, that's happening in many states. Uh, the push to deploy lots of solar and wind and shut down natural gas and uh, nuclear 
happened in California, happening in the Northeast, where you are. That's going to degrade the reliability and affordability of uh, the energy system. You know, the, the energy providers in the Northeast got really worried in Christmas a, a week or two ago, uh, where you are, because they couldn't get enough natural gas, because pipelines had been um, uh, canceled, so to speak. Um, so that's going to start to affect ordinary people. And I think eventually they're going to start to ask the question, tell me again why we're doing this. Uh, and that is going to lead to some kind of re-examination of the science. You know, I can fantasize that there should be a truth and reconciliation uh, kind of exercise, perhaps sponsored by Congress, about who knew what when uh, and who misrepresented what when. But I don't think that's ever going to happen. Uh, reality will eventually force uh, um, a reckoning uh, in what we do about all of this. Well, it takes us a little bit off topic, but I can't help but think about the Great Barrington uh, resolution and uh, the reaction to uh, the the COVID pandemic um, and the discrediting, I think it's fair to say, of many sources of scientific authority in, in retrospect now that we can see that, you know, maybe focus protection was shouldn't have been dismissed out of hand. Maybe herd immunity wasn't a bad word and things of this kind. You see parallels there? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, it's even worse in some ways. As we were working our way through COVID, there were a lot of scientific uncertainties, uh, particularly early on, and we started to understand more and more. Um, uh, but you couldn't say that one thing was more right than another at the beginning. Uh, it's just that you should have given credence to some of these alternative views, uh, which was not done, as you point out. I think here in the climate, we actually have a lot of data. We have some understanding, and it is the um, full understanding that is being suppressed. Um, you know, I, again, just to refer to my own particular case, um, as I told you, we've sold a lot of copies of books. Not a word in the New York Times, New York Times bestseller list, Washington Post. Nah. All right. Um, very rare to get a, a debate going on the science. I've been fortunate to be able to do a few over the last couple of months. Um, but, you know, the fact that you can, I can just publish the data, not my data, but the official data, and say, hey, this does not accord with what you're being told. The fact that I can only publish that in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which is a fine paper but has a limited readership, you know, suggest that there's a lot that people are not being told. Well, I don't understand why the National Academy of Sciences, of which you are a member, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. I am not, but I have served on committees from time to time. Of uh, Wouldn't impanel a, a high-level expert committee to overview the entire corpus of scientific work on this very important public issue and issue a definitive report or set of reports that basically replicate the arguments that you're making and unsettled, or other arguments if those were the ones that the evidence supported. But in any case, why wouldn't the NAS speak to this in an authoritative way? Well, you know, what you get out of the panel depends upon who you put on the panel. Uh, I had a friend once who was not a I have a friend who's not a climate scientist, but a very good engineer. And he was on one of these committees. Uh, and he describes the experience of walking into the first meeting of the committee saying, and the discussion was, well, we know what we're going to write. How can we write this? Uh, um, okay. Um, I, the selection of the panel, um, the modulation of the language, the difference between the summary and the content. Um, you know, a lot of these assessment reports depend upon adjectives adverbs um, to give a flavor to the non-expert, and you can yeah. spin it one way or the other. A lot of what's in my book, well, almost all of it is out of the official reports or the literature or the data. Um, and I think one of the powerful things in the book is exposing the disconnect 
between what the non-expert description is and what's actually going on with the science. Now, what about the Paris Accords? Or the possibility of international diplomacy, uh, being able to get the Chinese and the Indians and uh, the Europeans and the North Americans all on the same page on this. I mean, particularly in light of what you just observed about the fact that uh, most of humanity has yet to fully uh, empower itself to enjoy the benefits of of the modern technological civilization that we take for granted, which depends on fossil fuels. Ain't going to happen. All right. We're not going to reduce. <laughs> we're not going to go to zero, certainly by 2050. Even John Kerry admits that now. Uh, and we're not going to go to zero globally, certainly before the end of this century. Um, the demand. Oh, excuse energy, me. Can you just explain to people what go to zero I, I see, means? Okay. So the world emits a certain amount of greenhouse gases, mostly carbon dioxide, every year. Most of that emission is due to the burning of fossil fuel. Because the world is developing and the population is increasing, the amount of fossil fuels we burn every year goes up, has been going up at about 1.5% a year. In order to stabilize, not reduce, but just stabilize human influences on the climate, those emissions have to go to zero. If you want to stabilize the climate allegedly at one and a half degrees temperature rise, it goes to it needs to go to zero by 2050. Um, if you go to zero more slowly, um, the temperature will be higher. They say. Um, so the goal, political goal, uh, goal of the Paris Accord, is to get to uh, zero sometime in the latter half of this century globally. That means. No emissions of fossil fuels and use the conventional way. Also, by the way, you've got to fix agriculture, which accounts for about 25% of emissions. But basically, to get to an emissions-free world by 2050 uh, or 2100. So that's kind of the goal. But if you look at the drivers, the development, the rate of change of technology, the somewhat modest increase in population expected over the next 80 years, um, there's just no way that's going to happen. And you can understand that from the point of view of the Chinese or the Indians. Their overwhelming priority is to get enough energy for their people so that they can improve their lot. Um, the, the issue of, well, something might happen to the climate 100 years from now um, is just not particularly important relative to that overwhelming need. It's like telling a person, who is starving, that they need to worry about their cholesterol. Um, and, uh, you know, there are longer-term issues and there are shorter-term issues. And for most of the world's population, energy is a short-term existential issue. So, okay, it ain't going to happen. Ain't so gonna. You're, you're, you're in the prediction business now. Uh, and moreover, backlash is coming. I thought I heard you say that. Yeah, uh, I, certainly in the West, uh, the yeah. backlash is coming. I mean, you've got the energy crisis of the last year hitting Europe very hard, and there are a number of reasons for that crisis, but certainly one of them uh, has been the overinvestment in renewable energy and the underinvestment in fossil fuels. Uh, so you've got uh, that. You've got the regulations. Um, that are starting to bite um, in the U.S. Uh, you know, I think eventually we'll see electric cars, but not so fast um, and not so hard. One of the problems is the politicians like to push hard because they've got to demonstrate that they've actually done something in two years or four years. Uh, but the energy system really wants to change slowly. I like to say we should be doing it by orthodontia rather than tooth extraction. And right now, we're just trying to rush it much too rapidly without any coherent plan of how to get there. So, yeah, there's going to be pushback. Of course there is. Do you see any low-hanging fruit like, I don't know, methane or, you know, that yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, so methane is an um, important greenhouse gas. Um, so this is that for people who don't know. This is the natural gas that we use for heating 
uh, for producing electricity and for producing fertilizer and other petrochemicals. Um, uh, leaks of methane, uh, methane into the atmosphere more broadly, uh, account for mm, about half of the warming influence of carbon dioxide, maybe a little bit less. Um, and um, the virtue of methane is that it doesn't live for very long in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide persists for centuries. Methane disappears in a couple of decades, 18 years, 12 years, something like that. Um, but methane comes not only from fossil fuels when we pull it out of the ground, but it comes from agriculture, it comes from rice paddies, it comes from garbage dumps, and so on. So we can cut back on some of the methane, but not certainly all of it. Uh, it would be very hard to do that. It comes from cattle, right? The fancy name is enteric fermentation. Uh, the less <laughs> fancy name is, is cow burps. Um, and, you know, all cattle that um, um, eat cellulose, sheep, goats, uh, uh, cows, beef, um, they all produce methane. How bad was that uh, pipeline sabotage uh, in the Baltic? Well, you know, on a global scale, not that bad. All right. Uh -huh. um, I mean, it's hard for anything to have impact on a global scale. Uh, but uh, it had a much greater uh, influence on the geopolitics and the energy situation in, in Russia. Uh, you know, whether it was a good thing to have uh, that broken or not, I'm not going to opine. But um, in terms of climate impacts, uh, in the noise. I don't see right offhand anything left or right, Republican or Democrat, in what you've been saying. I see arguments, people can disagree, but I don't see a left or right in it. What accounts, in your view, for the fact that it was Tucker Carlson's uh, green room where I first met you? Yep, right, right. <laughs> and it's the Wall Street Journal that is the uh, only uh, major outlet that will publish his stuff. Yeah. Uh, and more, you know, the, the Republicans do seem to be a little bit less enthousi enthusiastic about the, the climate crisis. The Democrats seem to be running very strong on uh, we got to do something about climate. Do you think you understand at all why the partisan divide breaks the way it does on this? I, you know, the, I mean, the, the, no, I, I don't think so. What I can tell you is that when I talk to technically informed people who are not experts, whether they're scientists, engineers, uh, business folks who understand numbers very well, um, I get in private um, a lot of agreement, um, particularly with the leaders of the big energy companies. But they, I think, like the politicians, feel beholden to the stakeholders, not the shareholders, but the stakeholders, as are the politicians. And the popular uh, sentiment right now, for better or worse, uh, particularly among young people, is that the world is going to end unless we deal with this thing yeah. uh, rapidly. And that is so disappointing and in many ways immoral to have robbed young people of an optimistic future. Uh, and the fact that it's particularly concentrated in the West is even more disturbing. So, um, you know, as a scientist, all I can do is try to keep speaking the supportable uh, facts the supportable truth, and hope that eventually um, uh, the world will come around. All right. Well, thanks very much for sharing uh, your wisdom here at the Glenn Show. Um, my guest has been Stephen Coonan. He's a professor at NYU. He's the author of the book Unsettled, uh, What Climate Science Tells Us What It Doesn't and Why It Matters, which has sold over 200,000 copies. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, well, glad to have you on the show, Stephen. It's great to chat with you, Glenn.